Good morning. Nice to see everybody here. If you are able, stand with me as we hear the reading of God's Word. Our passage this morning is going to be taken from John's book of the Revelation, and we're in chapter 21. We'll be looking at verses 1 to 7. This is John's Word to us and God's Word to us. Chapter 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and earth had disappeared, and the sea was no more. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, dressed in beauty for her husband. Then I heard a great voice from the throne cry, See, the home of God is with men. He will live with them. They shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more, and never again shall be sorrow or crying or pain. For all those former things are past and gone. Then he who was seated in the throne said, See, I am making all things new. And he added, Write this down for my words are true, and they can be trusted. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the thirsty water without price from the fountain of life. And then he concludes here with, the victorious shall inherit these things. I will be God with them, and he will be a son to me. This is God's word. You may be seated. It's so good to be back. Some of you know we were uh, here about three weeks ago for the VBS. I love how you, it was really fun to see the excitement and what was going on. And and some of us met there uh, some of those evenings. It was so much fun. This is home. It really is. And and Yvonne's with me today and and we're good. Uh, We've been having a great time being back. And uh, actually on Friday night and Saturday we did some Uh, Saturday morning, we did some follow-up. And so what I wanted to do is, when Skip asked me to to preach, I kind of wanted to let it dovetail with what we shared three weeks ago and kind of what we moved forward on Saturday, Friday and Saturday. Um, And I hope that what I share, what you hear, is going to be individually an encouragement to us, but also as a congregation. Um, for those that weren't with us, we, we covered a lot of ground. We talked about looking at the gospel, looking at scripture that we're familiar with, the flow of it, but maybe in a little bit different way than we're accustomed to. Um, and uh, we called it, we referred to it, this particular approach, the four-chapter gospel. And um, to be perfectly honest with you, in looking and understanding Scripture in a little bit different way, kind of through this lens, it's really made a, a real enormous impact in my own personal life. I'll, I'll share a little bit about that. Um, what do you mean a four-chapter gospel? What's, what are you talking about? Well, um, the best one of the things I love about the Reformed faith is that we believe in looking at the whole counsel of God from beginning to end. And it's really important for us uh, to understand from the Bible perspective and God's perspective what he's saying at the beginning. I mean, for example, um, Steve, I mean, uh, yeah, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> what would you guys think? <coughs> Can I take some water? Alan, I'm sorry. What would you think if I said, hey, let's go to uh, a movie? go down here to the movie, or, Deb, I gave you a book, and I said, hey, (coughs) I want to go to that movie with you, but I want to start, let's meet 30 minutes into it. Or here's this book, and I hand it to you, and it's got the first four chapters out of it. What would you think? What would you think of me? That boy's lost his mind. 
In order for us to understand God's message, we need to start from the beginning to the end. We would never think of leaving the movie and doing that sort of thing. It just wouldn't happen. And so what I want to do as we, as we get into this thing, I want to understand that there are four chapters that we're talking about. The first chapter is creation. We're going to look at that. What do we learn in, <coughs> excuse me, what do we learn in the book of creation? Well, in Genesis, we see God almost as it is with, a, uh, with his fingernails with dirt, and he's creating. He's creating all things, and he's fashioning in the world to operate in perfect peace and unity, what, what the Old Testament prophets called shalom. We're familiar with this. So if you're, and by the way, I love the way we're doing this. I love your bulletin. If you're following along in your bulletin, it's on the back. I'm going to be kind of walking us through that, but I encourage us to look at that and see exactly what the context, because there's a lot of stuff. We're going to get through it quickly, but I want to share it with you. So, <clears throat> if you're following along, the first point is God created everything perfect. The Hebrew word is shalom. And we also discover that God made man and woman in his image for caring relationships with himself and with one another and with all creation. Then, after that, here in the creation discovery, we, we discover that God also gave Adam and Eve a specific assignment. What did he do? He said, be fruitful and multiply. So in other words, multiply on the earth, but also be fruitful and produce. Take my creation and nurture it. Develop it. He gave them what sometimes is called a mandate, a job description, if you will. Populate the earth and work with him and steward it as his co-laborers. So, in your outline, Adam had peace with God there at the beginning. And Adam and Eve were given a mandate to work with God, reproduce, and be productive. So, we are to steward his creation. Okay? Okay? We're to steward his creation. What an assignment. I mean, God has given Adam and Eve and us the task to be a co-laborer with him in all that he does. Now, these introductory chapters are really important. Why? Because this is sort of, I like to think of it as like a love story to us as people. And he tells us why and how and what we were created to do. So Adam and Eve's mandate to be fruitful and multiply and develop and steward the earth is our mandate. You know, I had never really understood that fully until I began to dig a little more into it. So as God fashioned Adam and Eve and gave them responsibility for the garden, he called them and he calls us to work with him for what he is doing in this world. Genesis 131 says, the Lord made everything and it was very good. That's the way he designed it. That word shalom, it's the way things ought to be. This is the way things ought to be. So in your outline, this tells us why we were created and what we were created for. Creation, friends, is the way things ought to be. Perfect, the way God designed. But then what happens? Things got really bad. The second chapter of the four-chapter gospel is the fall. We come to Genesis 3. Remember, the Bible starts in Genesis 1 and 2. We get the good story of creation. But now we come to the third chapter, and we find out about Adam and Eve's rebellion. They disobeyed God. We're familiar with the story. Broke his command, and everything fell apart. Everything fell apart. And the shalom, the, the weaving together of God and man with all of creation for flourishing and wholeness the way God designed, gone. That's the bad news. So in our outline, shalom is ruined. And we live in a broken world now. When I think about what happened in, in creation, think that Adam and Eve had response Ability. They were able to respond to God. Imagine. It says they were naked and they were not ashamed. 
They were open before God. And then they had, imagine a relationship with humans where there is no sin, no nothing. So they had responsibility with one another and then even with the earth. The earth produced and it was, I can't imagine what that was like. The ability to, to have all the flourishing imaginable. But now what happens? What does the fall do to that relationship with God? We're familiar with it. Adam, where are you? I was naked and I hid. Have you? Busted. So that's broken. And then, this is what kills me. Adam says, uh, God says, Adam, did you eat off that tree? Well, Lord, that woman that you give me, in so many words. So he blames God and he blames the wife for what he did. And what did she do? Who does she blame? Wow. And then, if that wasn't bad enough, what happens to the environment and the earth around them? Thorns. God called them to reproduce. Now there's going to be pain in childbirth. Wow. Some of you ladies know about that. A lot of them. And the earth, it's hard. I mean, in our work, everything is toilsome. Everything's broken now. So the fall means now that's the way things are. This is the world in which we live. But thankfully, it's not the last chapter, praise God. It's not the last chapter of our gospel narrative. Chapter 3, in your outline, you will see, is redemption. This is where it gets really exciting. The third chapter gives us a glimpse of the way things could and should be. Shalom has been smashed, but now Jesus comes and gives us the promise of a restored shalom. In this third chapter, this is the exciting part. God doesn't abandon us in some kind of valley to live in our mess. He doesn't leave us to die in sin and misery. He sends Jesus to begin the work of healing. Now listen, everything that was broken, everything. Relationships, the whole thing. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates His love for us in this. What? That while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So, here's hope in the redemption. And one of the key implications for this third chapter, we talked about during VBS and we saw a second ago, is, and I want to understand this, one of the important things that I never fully understood about Getting into creation is the why we were created and what for. Sometimes we focus a lot on the scripture and I understand in the redemption thing about what God's forgiveness through Christ saves us from. What does he save us? What are we saved from? Anybody? The wrath of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But oftentimes we, and I'm, this was one of the things that startled me a little bit when I started, we need to focus also on what it saves us for, from and for. This is, this is kind of where we're heading with this. And in your outline, as co-laborers with God, we're in the redemption now, we are to vote, we're to devote all we have and are at all times, in all relationships, and in all situations to God's glory to accomplish His sovereign purposes. Now, I'm going to give you some homework real quick. I'm going to be mean. Do you know what, when we go into the fellowship hall, do you know what's over the top up there, over the door as you go in? I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to make you go. Say, Rick, you're mean. That's right. I want you to go and look because it's at the heart of what we're talking about. You know, I hadn't really re- realized it. I remember when that building was built. But, I, you know, it's just sometimes things that seem so familiar, we can go right past us. Go over there and look sometime and see what's over the door. I'm teasing you a little bit. But the, what we're talking about and what it says there has huge implications for this mandate that we're talking about, what God has created us for as co-laborers. 
You know what the word stewardship is. As co-laborers, he expects us to devote everything that he's given us, our time, our energy. Some of us feel like I don't have a whole lot of that left. I hear you. Our skills. There are a number. We were talking the last couple of days. There are a number of you with amazing skills and experiences. That gray hair counts for something. But they said some of it turns and some of it turns loose. Well, that's okay. <laughs> but folks, listen, you guys represent an enormous amount of, if you want to call it resources, your experience, your life experience, the good and the bad. We have energy, we have time, we have resources, and God expects us to use all of that in every single relationship that we have, whether it's at home, here at the church, in the community, wherever, at work, whatever we're doing, volunteering, in every relationship and every single moment of our lives, we are to be those who are stewarding what he has given according to his sovereign plan that's going to ultimately restore all things. This is how we worship the Lord. Oftentimes, another thing I'm appreciating about this little journey that I'm on, uh, that I'll share maybe sometime with you, about the relationship between faith and work. So oftentimes, we, we kind of divide our Sunday life or our devotional life and then the rest of the week. There's this gap there. And there's a real problem with that because worship is to be done in everything that we do. I think we would say amen to that. But as one person said, we aren't supposed to just have devotional time. We're to have and live devotional lives. I chewed on that for a long time when I first heard it. We are to have, because it's easy to compartmentalize. Well, what in the world is my, what I do over there? Okay, I'll keep, put a Bible on my desk and I'll maybe give somebody a track. There's a little more to it than being salt and light where we are than just a couple of things like that. But the point is, as we faithfully and expectantly, in this third chapter of redemption, as co-laborers, we are to model what it means to live under the Lordship of Christ. And we are to demonstrate the way things could be. Looking at this passage from Revelation, listen, here's what we've got to understand, and I'm sure most of us do. He's getting a revelation from God, a, 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 some kind of amazing vision, lots of visions and stuff. And remember who he's reaching. He's writing this to the early church and folks, the persecution that was going on. And by the way, we need to be praying for the church today in, in our world that's going through a horrible persecution. But these people that he was writing to are getting ready to be fed to lions. Thank the Lord. And there's a bunch of us that are going through some stuff right now. I don't mean to minimize that, but thank the Lord. None of us are expecting that to happen to us. But the point is this. John is talking to people that are looking death right in the face. And he says, this is what's coming. Get a hold of this, dear ones, and we can face anything. I think that's what he's saying here. That's the context. And so, real quickly, what do we learn in these passages? Well, restoration reveals the new age. We understand that Jesus will return at the second advent, but he's going to complete what he did in creation that got messed up. And like I say, we don't, we don't have a, a lot of detail. We had these visions... He didn't even have adequate words oftentimes. Sometimes the prophets didn't even have the words to describe what they saw. But here's where the Greek will help us. We're looking at this book of the verses of Revelation where we're seeing a new heavens and a new earth, and John is trying to describe this. There are two words for the word in, in the Scripture in the New Testament for new. One of them is called neos, and that means brand new, brand spanking new. You call, you drive a new car, you drive it off a lot, and neos, brand new, whatever. But almost every time the word new is used in the New Testament, it's not that word, it's the word kainos. Whether he's talking about the new verse, 
the new birth or our, our new bodies or our new cells, the new creation, new heavens. And what this seems to mean is, and this is what commentators say, somehow in this new heavens and new earth, God's not going to just destroy everything. He's going to renew it. One, one fellow said, God don't make junk, and he don't junk what he made. I kind of like that. He's not going to just totally destroy it. If, if we are reading scripture right, he's going to somehow, some of the things that happen here are going to be moved over. Now, I can't imagine what that's going to look like. But at the heart of his plan is to restore what was broken in the fall, the promise of, of flourishing. So in your outline, in the restoration, we will see shalom restored. And some scholars, I don't know, John says in verse 2, let's go back to verse 2, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. A new city. And some scholars, I don't know, speculate that this thing could be 1,500 miles either way. But we just can't imagine. We don't know. But it's going to be unbelievable and something that we can't get our minds around. And even Abraham, the father of who, uh, those who believe, looked forward to the future city. We read, read in Hebrews 11. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So we have a new city that's coming up. But then we also have new relationships. Listen in verse 3. Then I heard a great voice from the throne crying, See, the home of God is with me, and he will live among them. They shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more, and never again shall there be sorrow or crying or pain. For those former things are past and gone. What this tells us is there are going to be new relationships. A new city, shalom restored. And starting, and listen to this, I can't imagine. Those are dear saints and friends that have gone on from this church. A lot of us, we know, we think we miss them. But they have perfect and intimate knowledge of God as we're sitting here. Can you imagine They have perfect, and those relationships that they knew, all relationships have been restored. And even the earth, we're told here, will not bear the natural disasters of sin. New creation, new city, new relationships. So in our outline, Jesus will return to establish his kingdom fully. All that was broken will be renewed. We'll have a new heavens and earth. There'll be a new Jerusalem. What else do we learn? This is something that I just can't get my head around. Scripture te- seems to suggest that we, we're going to be given authority and that we will rule and reign with God forever. Several passages talk about that. Given authority under his authority to rule. Paul outlines this, 2 Timothy. If you get a chance, look at 2, chap- chapter, uh, uh, 2 Timothy 11 to 13. He outlines this truth. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. Some of us are familiar with Ligonier Ministries. I love what they say here about this passage. One of the several of the trustworthy sayings found throughout First and Second Timothy and Titus, Paul outlines the incredible truth that those who persevere in faith are truly united to Christ and will live and reign with him forever. That's just what we read. And we don't, Do you think yourself as a king or a queen? I don't. I don't, hardly. But it says that we will rule over creation, and the consequence comes back to that mandate thing. He's giving us responsibility now, and somehow, some way, we're going to be ruling and in the new heavens and new earth. There's that mandate thing. Listen, this is what the commentator said. God made us to have dominion over creation. There's your mandate. To rule it for his glory. We forfeited our ability to, to fulfill this vocation in Adam, but Christ has succeeded in reigning over creation as the last Adam. In him, we are now once more able to achieve, listen, our original purpose as righteous rulers of the world. Oh, this is just... 
In 2 Timothy, the passage is, is talking about our future with reigning with Christ. It's just... And then the, the commentary goes on to say, we should all be looking forward eagerly to that final day. And then he draws us back to, back to ground. He says, but let's not forget that even now, that's in the future, but now we're reigning with Christ. This is what I want us to get hold of also. Sin no longer has dominion over us. Praise God. For those who believe in Christ, we live in a gracious area in which we have been adopted as God's children. That's Romans 6.14 and Galatians 4. By the Spirit, we can conquer sin by God's grace and grow in holiness. This is what it means to reign with Christ. And then we're also free from the tyranny of the law. No condemnation for those in Christ. Guilty conscience is gone in Christ. And so, in Christ, forgiven by Him, we can fulfill the royal law of liberty in serving our Creator. We read about that in 1 Peter 2 and James 1. Again, this is in line with the mandate and what Christ has called us to. So stop. Why do you think God is calling us to rule and reign with him? It's because he loves us. And he created us for himself. And we have this glorious future, stewarding the new creation for eternity. Like I said, I just can't imagine what that's like. So in your outline, under restoration, it's the way things will be. Creation, the way things ought to be. Fall, the way things are. Redemption, the way things could be. Now we're in restoration, the way things will be. Now, we're going to close. But I want to ask some questions. And we talked about this in our VBS time. What does all this mean to us? We're here and now, Rick. Let's, let's talk about something practical. We, we're going to do that. What do we do with these incredible truths. How do we respond to this? What does that mean for us in the here and now? Look, does anything that we do now really matter? I mean, let's be honest. This world, how many of you feel like in the last five years the world is really, everything's coming unglued? Does it seem like it's happening real fast? Yeah. And it would be easy to get, you know, just throw up our hands and, you know, wait a minute, wait a minute. Even though we struggle with life each day, dear ones, and we all do, in the midst of our brokenness, what I want to leave you with and what we're going to talk about the is what we do right now matters for eternity. It really does. We're not like those trying to uh, arrange the chairs on the Titanic. Boats going down, why bother? No, 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 no. Somehow, sovereignly, God will use the good that we have, that he's given us to steward, and move that in and make that part of the, uh, the new heavens and new earth. Some of us sitting here need a word of encouragement. I do. Even though we go through trials, there's hope. And I'm not trying to minimize some of the tough stuff that's going on, please. But I am saying that in Paul... Paul in Titus 2.13 reminds us that we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ. And then he reminds us in 1 Corinthians 15 there at the end when he says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain. Again, this has enormous potential and implications for us. And the work of the Lord, as we said, is in the redemption phase that we are, we give verbal proclamation of the gospel, but we also live it out in practical ways. We need to be about the gospel in word, but also in deed. Listen to what... N.T. Wright says about where we are now. This is great. And he said, this is really interesting. He says, church, you're not oiling the wheels of a machine that's about to roll over a cliff. He's talking about our endeavors here, whatever they are. You're not restoring a great painting that's going to be thrown into the fire. You're not planting roses in a garden that's about to be dug up for a building site. 
you are, and he says, as strange as it seems, maybe as strange as the resurrection and the whole thing, we are accomplishing something that will in due course be part of God's new world. Do you hear that? And here's the mystery. He says, we don't know exactly how God will accomplish this, but somehow our endeavors done in his name according to his plan will be brought over into the restoration of all things. Now, oops. You remember this? You guys remember this? I'm not going to undo it. I asked Steve to provide it. This represents eternity. Some of you might have missed that. But imagine a limitless rope all the way from that end. You remember what Steve said. And this represents our what? Our time on earth. And what we're hearing from Scripture is that this a little bit here will affect eternity future. Um, I hope you'll allow me to do this. This is something a little bit different than, than you're used to. And I have some helpers that are going to help me also. Um, So, what have we said? What we do in this world matters. What we do right now, what we do today, what we do tomorrow matters. Okie doke. How many of you all like going to Baskin Robbins? Anybody enjoy that? What is he doing? Just bear with me here. Here, my brother. How many enjoy going to Baskin Robbins? Let me see some hands. Are you awake? All right, all right, good, good. Here's the deal. We have been saying that with our lives, we model what it means on this earth right now to, and give, give Betty one. We get an opportunity to model under the Lordship of Christ what it means to live under His Lordship. And we give a hint at what the coming kingdom is going to look like. Why does my life matter, Rick? What have I done? You go to Baskin Robbins and you walk in, you don't know where to start. What do you see underneath the... The counters. 25, yeah, tubs. And you don't have, and say, so, well, what does the little gal or the guy behind the counter do? I can't decide. Well, what's that? And they do like this. And they hand it to you, don't they? Why do they do that? So you can get a foretaste of what that ice cream is going to taste like. You know where I'm going with this? Everybody sitting in here that names the name of Christ, you are a pink spoon. Because with everything you do, in the hard times, in the fun times, every endeavor, everything that happens in our lives, we are modeling here what the coming kingdom is going to look like as God's servants. I want you to think about that. This really impacts just about everything that we could, we could imagine. And so, let's pray. Father, as we consider what we've heard, what your word teaches us, we ask that you would use all that we are and all that we have to accomplish your purposes. Some of us are going through some really tough times. Some of us feel like giving up. Health issues, family challenges. I pray for this precious congregation. And I pray for this community around us, Lord, that you would use everything we are and everything we have Awaken our hearts, refresh us in you to understand that what we do matters. Not just now, but it matters for the kingdom to come. Thank you for loving us and caring for us. 
We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.